Hello, and welcome to our lunchtime lecture series. For this season, our theme is stories about science, and we are inviting authors to talk about their books, share their research, and tell stories of the history of science. I'm Meg Piorco, Allington Postdoctoral Fellow at the Science History Institute. It's my honor today to introduce our speaker, Michelle DeMeo, who also happens to be the director of the Offmer Library here at the Institute. Before I introduce Michelle, I'd like to mention the new format of our series. Lunchtime Lectures is now a digital series premiering on the Institute's YouTube channel with a new season every fall and spring. Today, Michelle will speak on her recent monograph on the incomparable Lady Ranelagh for about 30 minutes. And after that, we will have about 15 minutes of Q&A. I would like to invite anyone who has questions, comments, or wants to continue the conversation to interact with us on social media. You can find us at Sci History Org on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our speaker today, Michelle DeMeo, is the Arnold Thackeray Director of the Othmore Library here at the Science History Institute. She is co-editor with Sarah Pinnell of the essay collection, Reading and Writing Recipe Books, 1550 to 1800, and is the author of several articles on Robert Boyle and the Hartlib Circle. She is considered the leading expert on Lady Ranelagh and has been invited to lecture about Ranelagh at institutions across the US, UK, and Ireland. Today, Dr. DeMeo will be speaking about her new intellectual biography entitled Lady Ranelagh, The Incomparable Life of Robert Boyle's Sister, which was recently released with the University of Chicago Press's Synthesis Series. Welcome, Michelle, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, Meg. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, it's especially exciting to be introduced by you because you're also an Allington postdoctoral fellow here at the Institute. And that's actually when I started working on this book. I was also an Allington fellow here back in 2013. So uh, very excited to be introduced by you and to be back here giving this talk today. So today's talk, I will be discussing my book, which is an intellectual life of Robert Boyle and his sister, Lady Ranelagh. So many of you probably know Robert Boyle. He's known to historians and scientists alike. Uh, he used to be called the father of chemistry because he's done so many contributions in the field. Uh, Boyle's law, the fact that uh, pressure and volume of gas are at a constant temperature are inverses is still taught in chemistry today. Um, but perhaps one of his most important contributions is to the development of the scientific method. This is his emphasis on observation, documentation, and reproducibility in science. So what we know is that uh, Boyle moved into his older sister, Lady Ronelay's house, and they lived the last 23 years of their lives together. He had a laboratory on this house. People used to visit to see experiments. And there's been a lot of questions about what she did. And the traditional narrative to date has been that she was his hostess, that she let people in the door, she might have cooked dinner, but no one really knew if she was intellectually involved with any of his work. So that was my question uh, getting into this. And what I learned was that it's a very interesting story, and I'm telling it in the reverse, that this book is about her life, and I bring Boyle in where it's uh, helpful to talk about who she was. So she is 12 years older than him. He never marries and she separates from her husband in her 20s. And Boyle, when he does move in, they live these last 23 years of their lives together. Um, and what we find is a, an intellectual um, and spiritual partnership between the two of them. It's a very close bond between the siblings. So in order to tell this story, uh, it, it involves traveling to archives, uh, I wouldn't say around the world, but across uh, the UK and the US. This is four of the five countries that I had to visit. Um, but there's also stuff in the US at Yale, UCLA, and the Folger Shakespeare Library. And what I found is that there's more than 100 letters written by her. There's several dozen written to her. There's manuscript treatises that she wrote, uh, handwritten documents that were never published. There's copies of her recipe books. And there's hundreds of comments about her in the diaries and letters of male peers that she knew. So. It's 
studying Lady Ranelagh and trying to piece her life together is almost like the complete opposite of working on a man like her brother at this time period. Because if you were to study Robert Boyle and try to write his life, you could look at these modern collections here. On, um, you see the picture on the screen. Really, really great stuff. Uh, his, his correspondence and his complete works have are now available in modern collections in modern editions that have footnotes, they have contextual information, and they're all packaged and published in a way that you don't have to travel to visit uh, the archives. Now, this is um, partly because Boyle himself uh, prepared for his death. So when he was dying, he took his, uh, he wrote down inventories and he left everything to the Royal Society in London. And then for centuries over this time, Archivists were able to work on his stuff. They could uh, organize the information. They could make it accessible. Um, and now it's digitized. There's updated cataloging standards. And it's very easy to find materials on Robert Boyle. Uh, quite the opposite still with his sister. So what came out of all of this research was, I think, in some ways, a surprisingly rich life. Uh, Robert Boyle, like I said, the story has been that he moves in and she's kind of helping him. But if you look at the way that the um, archival evidence speaks, it's chapter seven that Robert Boyle moves in. She has a very full life before he moves in. And uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about this today. It's a full life filled with science and medicine, but there's also a, um, a separation from her husband. There's political activism. She's interested in religion and education. Uh, it's a it's a very rich life um, and a very public life, I would say, as well. So to tell this story, I, who is she, I guess, and who was she to her peers is maybe the first question we might ask. So these are some of the men that uh, you may or may not know some of their names today, but they she I think what's interesting about this is that she knew all of these great men and they all had very great things to say about her. In the back left there is uh, Gilbert Burnett, and he gave the funeral elegy for Robert Boyle when he died. And when he did so, he had a, has a long section in there in which he has to praise Lady Ranelagh as well. It was impossible for him to talk about Boyle without also talking about Ranelagh. And he says, she lived the longest on the publicest scene. She made the greatest figure in all the revolutions of the kings for above 50 years of any woman of our age. And he concluded, such a sister became such a brother. Uh, really lovely quote. On the back right of this, you see John Evelyn. Uh, he is a fellow of the Royal Society and comments that Lady Ranelagh is a person of extraordinary talents. On the bottom left there, we have uh, Henry Oldenburg. He's the first secretary of the Royal Society. And she knows him uh, for many years before he goes on to have this role. And he speaks of her as that very noble and pious Lady Ranelagh. He actually had his mail sent to Lady Ranelagh's address, and they were near neighbors well before Boyle moved into London. And then on the bottom right, we have John Milton. Uh, which you may know he's the author of Paradise Lost, a very famous uh, epic poem at the time. He was, uh, she hired him as the tutor to her son. Uh, he thought very highly of her. And um, he, he speaks, uh, he, he often was praising her and, and told, uh, tries to instill morals in her son as well to follow in her footsteps. So it's fair to say that everyone knew and loved her uh, it, during her own lifetime. She was a very public presence. And so what did she do that was so significant? And how is it possible that almost immediately after her death, no one knew about her after that? So let's start with her early life. Um, she is born in Ireland. In uh, it, She's actually born in a town next to Lismore, um, but the parents moved to Lismore Castle uh, when she's young. And that's where Robert Boyle is born uh, later as well. And the Boyle boys received the best educational opportunities of the time, but the Boyle girls were not given any formal education. When she was nine years old, she was contracted to Mary and she was sent to Leicester in England and lived there for several years and then eventually returned to her parents' house uh, at Lismore Castle at age 13. That's when she would have met uh, her baby brother, Robert Boyle, uh, who would have just been, um, 
he would he would have been a baby at the time and their mother dies uh after giving birth to the 15th child right at that time so Catherine is about uh 15 and he is uh three he just turned three when his mother died so you can imagine he starts she starts to basically take on a surrogate mother role for the young Boyle children and this has been acknowledged uh by many historians over the years uh, Ronnelly then moves, uh, uh, gets married um, and moves to Athlone and lives there for an extended period of time, but she continues to have frequent trips to the Boyle family properties. She is then trapped in Athlone uh, in 1641 during the Irish Rebellion, and she's trapped in the castle for one year and then eventually moves to England with four children, and she leaves her husband to fight in the wars. Uh, she's 28 years old at this time. It's worth saying it was not a good marriage uh, to the Ron to Lord Ranelagh, and uh, she uh, creates a new life for herself independently in London. So when she arrives in Lon in England, it's at the start of the English Civil Wars, and you don't have to worry too much about the dates here, but I have them here because it's important to recognize that there's almost two decades of national civil unrest taking place here. Uh, the king is executed, there's a protectorate, there's the interregnum is happening, there's, there's wars. Um, so from 42 to 60, it's a time of, of civil unrest. And these are very important years for her. It's her late 20s and into her mid 40s. And at this time of, at, at times when there's um, times of war and rebellion, historians often see that this is a chance for other voices to enter into uh, mainstream conversations and influence debates. Norms tend, social norms tend to break down and there's a little bit more opportunity for others, such as women, uh, to enter this conversation. So uh, she does this in a variety of ways, but much of this is through her work with a group called the Heartlip Circle. Uh, I have about three chapters of my book that's dedicated to her work with the Heartlip Circle. This was a group of self, I would say, um, self-selecting individuals. They were interested in the new science, um, but more generally uh, interested in copying and disseminating useful information across Europe and into the American colonies. It's a group that saw the, civil, the times of civil war um, and interregnum as an opportunity for social change, uh, a real um, an optimistic uh, group that was trying to, to better society through education, and she was a part of that group. It's a forerunner to the Royal Society, which was founded in 1660 when the Hartlip Circle dissolves, and many members of the Hartlip Circle would go on to become part of the Royal Society. Not all, but many. So Ronald is a, a very big part of this group. Um, and in fact, her role is much bigger than her brother, Robert Boyles, who's still quite young at this time and not really involved in these networks. But her activities here, um, she initiated dialogues about political structures. Uh, she suggested limiting the power of the monarchy. She advocated for a proposal to decimalize the English currency over 300 years before it was actually accomplished. Uh, there's over 200 mentions of her throughout this archive. And one of the challenges in finding all of this information was that her name is spelled almost 20 different ways. Um, and sometimes she's just referred to as my lady. And you need to know the larger context to know that my lady is Lady Ronelay. So it was a challenge to uh, pull it all together. But uh, what we found is that she's one of the most significant members of this circle. And it was uh, a, a huge, uh, a very supportive community for her um, to be involved in. Um, go back to just double check this quickly. OK, you could cut this. I couldn't remember if I was going to speak about this now. I'll jump to the next slide. So chemistry is really at the heart of this story, and the the Hartlib circle is becomes very interested in uh, chemistry in itself in the late 1640s. And it's difficult in some ways to know whether it was Lady Ronelay or Robert Boyle who got interested in chemistry first. What I will say is that at this time, when they're working on this in the mid 17th century, chemistry is still a very young discipline and it was seeking to define itself and professionalize itself. And by some people, it was still seen as a woman's discipline. 
you can see here in this picture that some popular books were market, marketed chemistry to women. Uh, basic tasks like distillation uh, could be used in the household, but also used in pastry making. Um, and so it's all part of a housewife's duties uh, in her still closet that she would have. But chemistry also had other practical benefits. It could be used for agriculture um, or medicine. So it was very much an attractive and practical science for a group like the Hartlip Circle that was seeking to improve society during these times of civil war and interregnum. Um, so like I said, Ronalee, at this time when she's getting interested in this, it's the late 40s, early 50s. Um, she is in London and she's part of this larger network, the Hartlip Circle. Now, Robert Boyle, he spent some time going to the uh, to Europe. He does a grand tour and gets his education, comes back to England. He moves to Stallbridge, which you probably saw earlier on that map is is quite uh, I'll, mo I'll come back to it and show you. Uh, Stallbridge is, is quite removed from London at this time. He moves there and then he ends up going to Oxford, which is a little closer, but he's still not in London. And um, this is it's it's difficult i think for him to get access to a lot of the materials that he needs so he he gets them partly by by corresponding with his sister she helps ship uh some of his chemical instruments and apparatus to his to stallbridge so that he can practice uh chemistry there but eventually i think he starts to feel a bit isolated in stallbridge and talks about moving to oxford where there's more people studying chemistry and she is the one that when he goes to oxford goes there first, visits the rooms, and makes sure that he has a room that's not drafty and that he has access to a laboratory and that his you know, he has a, a network there to support him. So she's very much involved in that as well. Uh, he eventually moves in, he eventually moves in uh, to London and the, down the road, but uh, at, for the short term, he's in Oxford. Uh, now Boyle himself, while I would say that there's uh, practical aspects of chemistry. Boyle is part of a group that was interested in elevating chemistry beyond just the practical and was very interested in uh, theoretical chemistry as well as a larger, I would say, an understanding of not just witnessing that something works, but trying to think back about what does that mean about the world and why does it work. And he very much uh, in his book, Skeptical Chemist, which comes out a bit after this, he talks about a hierarchy of chemists. He talks about vulgar, vulgar chemists, uh, which are kind of the, this like uh, practical chemistry and chemical philosophers, those who can actually understand uh, the meaning behind what they're doing and the larger application of it in the world. Now, it would be wrong to say that because Ronalee is a woman, she was only interested in the practical aspects. And because Boyle is a man, he, he knew the theoretical ones. And we know that because of some of the uh, correspondence they have between each other. Uh, there is one letter in 1665 when uh, she endorses his forth forthcoming work, Origins of Forms and Qualities, and says uh, that she's hoping that the ignorant and wholesale philosophy in the doctrine of Aristotle and the schools that have gone current in the world will basically be uh, shattered by his new thesis here. So she's um, involved in some of the theoretical conversations um, and advances that he's making as well. Um, and ad additionally, she's also working with uh, folks in the Hartlib circle on chemistry and larger uh, natural philosophy or scientific questions. Not, and some of these are completely independent of, of Robert Boyle as well. Uh, this particular one that I have here is one of my favorites. Uh, it's a chemical, it's a chemical ex exchange that she has uh, regarding a, a famous man. There was a man called uh, Dr. Butler, and he was known for his stone and uh, the philosopher's stone, uh, where he was trying to transmute space metals um, into gold. And many of the chemists were trying to figure out at this time whether he he was a he was scamming or if this was actually possible and she writes this dialogue very very clearly on what she knows uh it gives evidence that it, it has names and facts it's it's a a test it's a witness testimony and this document gets it gets um transcribed and it's circulated um a full year after it's written there are, are um john winthrop jr who's in the american colonies here is commenting to Hartlib about how helpful this document was that she wrote. It's a full year after she wrote it and it's circulating still. So she was her um, views on on uh, credibility of sources and um, 
information that people were gathering around early chemistry was valued amongst the Harlem circle. She also tested um, an early microscope model when it was uh, just brought onto the market and uh, some members of the Hartlib circle were talking about the size of it being fit for her hand. Uh, so we know that her peers uh, took her comments on this very seriously. Now, some of this changes uh, with the founding of the Royal Society in 1660. So like I mentioned, the monarchy was restored. Uh, Charles II comes back in and these two decades of kind of uh, intellectual and social turbulence are seen to kind of calm down. And with that is the founding of the Royal Society, which um, is still in London today. But there are some real differences with how the Royal Society worked versus how the Hartlib Circle worked. In the Hartlib Circle, there was not a formal membership structure and individuals could opt in, uh, fellow or uh, members invited each other, it was self-selecting. The Royal Society was much more formal. One had to be nominated uh, and one also had to pay dues to become a fellow of the Royal Society. Now, no women that we know of were nominated um, and only one woman was invited to visit. And that woman is Margaret Cavendish, who you can see on the right here. Um, I think she's an interesting case study for the opposite way that a female scientist in the 17th century could be involved in science. Now, Margaret Cavendish had a complete disregard for piety and social norms that were typical of a woman at the time. And she didn't care. She flaunted that. And I, she liked being you know, the, the person who kind of uh, called out uh, the mainstream and uh, she liked to shake things up. And so, uh, there's comments uh, in the diaries of uh, Samuel Pepys about seeing her uh, and all her men covered in velvet, and you know she was she liked the attention, and so she got invited to the Royal Society. And when she did, it was all the talk of the town. Uh, you can find references to this in letters, in diaries. Everyone's talking about Margaret Cavendish visiting the Royal Society, and it was Robert Boyle who was asked to perform an experiment for her when she visited. This was, um, and uh, when she comes, this is in April of uh, 1667, and he prepares this entertainment and she arrives late. She has the society as well as a huge public audience apparently waiting for her to come in and walks in. The, the message goes that she gave condescending approval and left. Um, and Peeps notes that all the town talk is nowadays of her extravagancies. So there's no record of Boyle and Lady Ronelay having talked about this particular visit together. He was staying at her house. So most likely what happened is he went home and talked to her about it, but there's no written record because they lived together, which is a frustration for historians, but it makes sense. Um, but what we do have is a letter that she wrote to her other brother, uh, Lord Richard Burlington. And to him, she says, by all the characters I hear given her, I am resolved that she escapes Bedlam only by being too rich to be sent thither. But she is mad enough to convey, to convey the title of the place of her residence, whose boldness and profaneness is allowed to pass for wit. Um, so Bedlam, like an insane asylum, she's saying she's crazy. And, uh, you know, Lady Ronelay was a very modest gentlewoman. She carefully crafted an intellectual reputation that was grounded in piety and humbleness. And I, she, she disapproved of, uh, of Margaret Cavendish's ostentatious behavior and also seems to have been um, unimpressed by the intellectual quality of her arguments. So these are kind of two extremes that women were given if they were interested in, uh, in access to uh, science at the time. But just because uh, Lady Ronelay was not a member of the Royal Society, it, it that is, does not mean that she suddenly gave up science. There's um, There has been a trend uh, previously in the history of science to talk about how doors closed on women come 1660 and that uh, women were no longer allowed to participate in science at that time because of the founding of these formal institutions and organizations like the Royal Society. My argument is that women did continue to work on this stuff. We just need to use different tools to find that information in, in the archives um, today. So Ronalee did, she, she did get involved. She just chose a method that was more appropriate for a 17th century woman. And that was 
through various ways, including commenting on Robert Boyle's drafts before they were printed. Uh, we saw some evidence of this earlier, like the quote I showed you about her reading origins of the forms and commenting on his critiques of Aristotle. So she's, she's behind the scenes, uh, reading his stuff and editing it, even if it goes under his name when it's printed. He also does thank her. Um, he calls her Sophronia here. And this is the other way that she's there. She's never named, he never names her in print uh, in his books. And again, it's because of her modesty. Um, if you see, there is a quote um, on this um, where he says, if her modesty did less confine her pen to excellent letters, that she could make the wits of our sex envy a writer of hers. He calls her a mistress of wits and eloquence. Um, so I don't know if you could see that uh, on the bottom of the page uh, on the left and on the top uh, on the right. But uh, he very much admires Lady Ronelay. He acknowledges her for uh, all the work she's done, um, not just you know general encouragement, but also her intellectual and moral uh, contributions to his to his own growth and well-being. So all of this um, happens, though, after Robert Boyle officially moves into her home in Pall Mall. And the location of the house um, is actually this under the M here in Pall Mall. This, this here is where we think their actual house is. It's got the little uh, alleyway where his laboratory was on the back. And uh, folks could come in and see the experiments in there. Uh, but by this time, when he when he officially moves in, many of the experimentalists in Oxford, whom he was working with, had already also moved to London. Uh, and he, Boyle himself, had been considering it for years. He would go back and forth and um, do some long stays with his sister. But it was, he officially moves in. Uh, one of the letters before he does so is in 1666, um, Dr. Daniel Cox, who was a fellow of the Royal Society, but also worked with Lady Ronelay on medicine at the time. He wrote um, explicitly to Boyle, and he mentions Sophronia, so mentioning the, uh, the the book that he had recently published dedicated to Lady Ronelay. And he starts talking about how Boyle should move to London so he could basically be with his, his soulmate or his sister, uh, Lady Ronelay. And he says that she reciprocated his deep love for her and even transcended it, and that the two were linked in more than just blood, but also embellishments of mind and congruity of disposition. This idea that um, they're not just brother and sister, but they were actually intellectual partners as well. So he does move in um, and they live together for 23 years of their lives and they die just one week apart from each other in December of 1691. Uh, so chapter seven uh, in my book covers all of this, but what is I think uh, interesting about this is, you know, you might think I wrote this book and everyone's really interested in what happens when Boyle moves into Ronelay's home. And why is it just one chapter? It's because I have so little evidence at this point. So when she's writing letters to the Hartlib circle or to her brother when he doesn't live with her, there's a whole bunch of letters exchanged between the two, of course. When they move in together, there's no need for writing letters anymore, right? I mean, if there's, there used to be letters where they would send equipment to each other or request lemons for, you know, a, a medical experiment where they needed ingredients. Well, now she could ask him for lemons, right? So they don't need to write it down. It's a challenge um, for historians. So unless I can work backwards um, from some of these uh, printed references, I have, I have little, little to go on. Um, but we also do find some evidence in the uh, works of others. Uh, for instance, Robert Hooke, uh, the author of Micrographia, um, he talks about how he built a when he built the laboratory on the back of the house, uh, he notes that he dines with Lady Ronelay on these visits uh, throughout the 1670s. And one of them says, dined at Lady Ronelay's nevermore, uh, leaving us to wonder what she said to him exactly. But this is how we piece together the evidence, uh, what was there. Um, but there's... The printed works, is, if, as long as you know what to look for, you can sometimes find little references. So if um, one of these, uh, Usefulness of Natural Philosophy, is actually written to Pyrophilus, who is Ronelay's son. Again, they're never named, in, uh, men, named uh, by their names. But throughout this, uh, Boyle talks to Pyrophilus and says things like, 
there's a woman we both know, or um, a dear woman close to us, Pyropolis, who you know very well. Occasion, I can't remember, I think he might say your mother explicitly, but it's mostly written in a contextual way that you just have to know that that lady is Lady Ronelay. Um, but there's several mentions in this book of her using Boyle's Enns Veneris recipe. This is the essence of Venus. Uh, Venus was copper. And it's one of his three prized chemical recipes. And it was a, comp a copper compound that was used to treat rickets at the time um, with children. And so uh, the dose itself was was quite varied. Um, it was it was some it was often given to children, and sometimes one, two, or three grains is what he would say. And that um, he worked he would say we, uh, and it was Boyle and Ronelay who worked together on this. Um, you can see some of the references um, to it in this as well. Uh, Here's you and you, Pyropolis, and I know a great lady who was very neat and curious. That's that's um, Lady Ronelay. And there's another um, reference to her with the medicine um, as well. Here's a reference to uh, two persons of right. We commonly administer four or five or six grains at the time that we is Boyle and Ronelay together. Uh, so we know this that she was a very active medical practitioner, partly because of the letters from great men that she was writing to, but also because of her recipe books that she left behind. Some of her patients um, after 1660 um, are mentioned here. It's uh, sons of uh, James, who was later the king. Uh, Clarendon is very involved in the courts as well. And the children of William Penn, I'm talking to you here from Pennsylvania. Um, so it's, it's great to have a Pennsylvania connection as well. Uh, but she also, some of the letters, one of them is uh, she's in the room with Thomas Willis, who's uh, one of the founders of neuroanatomy at the time. And Willis uh, performs an autopsy and discusses this with Lady Ronelay, and she writes it down in one of the letters to one of her other brothers. Um, the letters also show that she disagreed with the doctors and would sometimes use advocate for additional treatments that would provide pain relief when the doctors were not providing pain relief to her patients. Um, these letters often will also integrate uh, Boyle and Ronelay's medical practice throughout their lives. It was a true partnership, and it's difficult sometimes to see when her advice stopped and his started um, throughout these letters. But on the right, we can see here, this is a, a letter that she wrote towards the very end of her life. Um, and if you can see on the side here, it, it closes with my brother, uh, this is to the Countess of Panmure, and it closes with my, bo my brother begs your grace to receive his humble service here, um, which is kind of like saying my brother says hi. I mean, these, these letters often have a reference uh, to the both of them together, and people write to one, they write to both of them together. Um, the letter on in the, the uh, last piece I really would like to mention is uh, on the left here, considerations and doubts upon the vulgar method of physic. The reason um, I want to mention this is it's the last way that I'm able to tell that she's involved in his work is that if it's not a direct letter or if it's not a printed work that I'm working backwards from, one way that I can tell sometimes that she's involved is that like there are quotes that are in Boyle's text that sound like Ronelay's voice that I can later go back and date in the letters that he's using her thoughts or using her words in his text. And I don't see it too often, but one of the places I very clearly see it is in this particular text. And what this is, is it's an attack on physicians for their unwillingness to try new remedies and for basically, um, it's an attack on traditional scholarship and the way that medicine was practiced at that time. Boyle was involved with this as well, but he suppressed the publication. I think Boyle was very careful, non-confrontational, and would often uh, vacillate between two different sides and pre present a more holistic, fair argument. Uh, Lady Ronelay is much more targeted, and um, this has more evidence of her, her the way that she spoke um, than Boyle. And it might be it might be part of the reason why she advocated that he do it and part of the reason he also didn't publish this in his life. But I talk more about that in Chapter seven, if you're interested. Um, and uh, the timing seems to work well, too. It's right after two of her own children died and she feared the death of her daughter in law. 
So what happens then? Uh, Boyle and Ronnelly both died, like I said, in December of 1691. And the funeral elegy that Bishop Gilbert Burnett gave praised both of them. So if Ronnelly was known to everyone and she really was such a public figure, why don't we know about her till now? Um, my conclusion in this book is a, is a chapter that discusses her death and the legacy of women, of female intellectuals uh, in the past. And what I show there is that this, this treatment of, of men and women's archival records happens during their own lives and continues on immediately after their death and by archivists and historians for decades, for centuries after, really. Um, Boyle, when he dies, uh, he, he identified literary executors and these individuals collected his books and manuscripts. He had labels saying where the boxes and folders were. He had color coded ribbons uh, identifying where things were in his bedchamber and his great room. Um, we do have none of that for Lady Ronelay. This was then passed to the Royal Society. And in 1769, they didn't receive the entire collection because it did change hands throughout the years. But there was still an estimated 15,000 folio pages. Um, as opposed to me bouncing around the country today trying to find these hundreds of letters. So um, the first attempt at telling Robert Boyle's life was in 1699, but he never really fell out of public awareness. Lady Ronnelly, on the other hand, it was in the mid 1700s when uh, George Ballard was compiling the memoirs of several ladies of Great Britain who have been celebrated for their writings of skill in the learned languages, arts and sciences. He has Lady Ronnelly listed but she's one of 17 women that he says that he couldn't, he basically couldn't find anything. Um, he knew she was important, but um, he could collect very little else relating to them. This is because women did not compile their own archives or prepare for their own memorialization after death. Uh, I have a quote here from Anna Marie von Sherman, who is one of Lady Ronelay's contemporaries. And she's saying that women scholars are soon enveloped by a useful obscurity upon their deaths. The memorials to women's names are no more in evidence than the traces left by a ship crossing the ocean. You can picture the ship is there, everyone sees it, but once it's gone, the waves disappear and there's no evidence that it was ever there. That's, that's the metaphor for women uh, who worked in these public fields in the past. So the legacy today, we're working to change this. Uh, in 2015, I was asked to unveil a plaque at the 400th anniversary of Lady Ronelay's death, uh, Lady Ronelay's birth. Um, very proud of this. This was in, um, it's now next to Robert Boyle's plaque at Lismore Castle in Ireland. Um, and my thanks to the Robert Boyle Summer School in Lismore for uh, really embracing Lady Ronelay in the history of science and inviting me out to unveil this plaque and work with them on the wording for this. Um, but to conclude today, um, you know, this is the first book on Lady Ronelay. I hope it's not the last. I hope that if you can't buy it, maybe your library um, be interested in purchasing it. There are electronic and print copies available. Um, I have my handle there for Twitter and available on Facebook and happy to chat with any of you if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle, for um, sharing. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing um, the, this very like intimate glimpse into the life of Lady Ronelay with us uh, and your process uh, in writing this book. So I'd like to um, do some Q&A, if that's OK. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, you mentioned that you started this project when you were an Allington postdoctoral fellow here at the Science History Institute, previously known as the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was wondering how you initially became interested in Lady Ronelay as a topic. Yeah. Um, so it's it's funny because I, I wasn't starting by looking for her. I was in graduate school when I first learned who she was and found her. I was interested in recipe books at the time. And I was working on uh, this idea that I showed with uh, chemistry that it often started in the household and that women were working on chemistry. So I was looking to find evidence of 
women's domestic practice in science and medicine. And I was at the University of Warwick out in England, and there, there we found hundreds of them. It was um, at a time when recipe books were just being discovered again in the archives, and we were compiling databases, and we found hundreds of them, and it was very exciting. But they, a lot of them looked similar to each other, and we started flipping through them, and you start to see the same names and the same recipes. But then one of them really stood out to me, and it's the one I showed earlier, that uh, British Library Sloan manuscript. Mm -hmm. It's such a strange book because it had a bunch of alchemical cipher. Um, there were symbols within it. Even just the format, it has this reference to being more valuable than gold. It had Thomas Willis's name in the front. And I just knew it was different from any of the others I was looking at. And I didn't know who she was. Her name was spelled, I told you, her name spelled like over 20 different ways. So her name was spelled in a really funny way on the manuscript too. So I took it to my supervisor and said, you know, this one looks different. I don't know what this is or how to read it. And she was like, oh my God, that that's Boyle's sister. This is, this is your dissertation. And that's how I got really into her. Um, it all kind of kicked off from there. And then I found the letters and started recreating the life. Great, that's so fascinating. Um, I wanted to know what advice you would give to scholars who are searching for marginalized stories in the archives? Yeah, it's a good question, Meg, because I feel like when I started working on this, there was so little support given to how to research women in the archives. Um, it's something that I think many of us just have to figure out ourselves. And I, I would love for there to be more official training um, and discussion around this because a lot of the work involves identifying the man that she's writing to and then looking at the broader archive and figuring out work working back from the men essentially is i think the first step for trying to identify women um but then also you know modern editions are so 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 valuable because the original texts of course are, are a great start too but once you have several years of scholars who are going through and can footnote and say, here's contextual evidence that relates this particular reference to a lady to this particular letter. Like that's the kind of research that I hope more scholars will be doing because it can identify some of those individuals that were just hidden from the record for many years. Yeah, so like a collaborative effort among scholars to find totally. um, yeah. sort of hidden stories. Yeah, um, and I think archivists and librarians have a lot to do in this as well. Um, I think, you know, we're trying to do some reparative cataloging and improving metadata so that if you do a keyword search for a woman, you'd actually find them because right now you wouldn't. Yeah, that's really interesting, especially because you mentioned how differently her name is spelled in different references to her that aren't even her name, right? Like her right. Name, pet name from her brother. Um, right. Because I mean, I think about the Heartlip Circle, it's those papers are digitized but you have to spell her name, like I said, 20 different ways to even find the references to her. So it's it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what is one of the most surprising things you learned about Lady Ronelay during your research? Um, or also uh, one of the most surprising places you found her in the archive that you weren't expecting to find her? That's a good question. Well, the, you know, the William Penn one was a surprise to me. Um, I actually only found that very recently after moving to Philadelphia. Um, and it, I was so excited, but I, I did not know that she was uh, writing, you know, to Philadelphia. And that was, yeah, it was really, that was an exciting one. Um, I think one of the stories that is um, particularly shocking to me, let me think about it. There's There's a couple. One is this autopsy uh, of the child. So she's writing this letter to one of her brothers mentioning that this child um, died. And she goes into kind of dramatic stories about like the kids like painful screams at the end and trying to ease his pain with these. I mean, it, it's kind of hard to read. But then once it's over, she's talking about it with this very detached almost scientific uh, detachment about his brain being open and the fluids there. And I was surprised. I've not seen that anywhere. Um, That's, I, I vividly <laughs> remember that part of the book because it was very, um, it, yeah, just um, scientifically explaining 
what I, I was surprised that they did an anatomy on a child because it I know. was in the um like royal family, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. It and I think it's it is it's strange. And so it wouldn't have I mean the way that that would have worked. I've only found one other reference to any woman being a part of an autopsy, but they were pretty new at the time. And I think it was because it was Thomas Willis. And this was at the time when he was really interested in, in brains and neuroanatomy and something happened that he was having seizures and they figured this was some sort of neurology that he died from. But, you know, I think in some ways it was, she was in the right place at the right time because that particular experience, it seems like she was supposed to be there as a mourner because she talks about wearing all black and attending the royal family. But then she's also moving in these scientific circles and communicating. So I don't know if she's physically there when the autopsy happens or more likely maybe she's just talking to Willis after he was present. But it was, um, yeah, I guess that was one of the more shocking things when I saw it. It is shocking to read too, yeah. Yeah. So it seems like a this is part of a recurring theme throughout the book of her balancing um, piety and almost using it as a tool to get into these scientific conversations. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And and I wouldn't even say um, it's done in a way that's like underhanded or anything like that. Like, I think this was her way in. And because she was so pious and respected, I think these men also trusted her with this valuable information and saw her as a peer. Yeah, um, that brings me to a question that I have. Um, you, a few times in the book and in this lecture, have juxtaposed Lady Ranelay with Margaret Cavendish um, yeah. as sort of... Uh, two extremes of ways in which women um, used their gender to enter into these um, scientific conversations in like completely different ways. Right. Um, and I was wondering if you know of any other women figures in the history of science um, that have either employed these two different strategies or maybe fall somewhere more in the middle. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I think, to be honest, most of the evidence I've seen is along the Lady Ranelagh, um way of doing things. I think Margaret Cavendish really is an extreme example. But when you start to look in the archive, there are a few other women. They tend to be much more on the Lady Ranelagh side. Um, so some examples, uh, Anne Conway is a, a natural philosopher. She's involved with uh, the Cam Cambridge Platonist group and uh, is very much respected for her opinions as well and forwards some of the philosophical conversations of her time. Um, Elizabeth Gray is known for her medical expertise and is called in to treat uh, people as well and is seen as an expert amongst the Heartlip Circle and later publishes a recipe collection. Um, but I mean, the, the common theme between these women is they either were, if they did publish, it was anonymous or it was posthumous after they died. And there's actually um, a quote, I think I have it somewhere at the beginning of the book where uh, John Locke, the philosopher, has a long uh, correspondence with Lady Marsham and they're talking about you know, philosophical con concepts. And in, I think it's like 1685, she writes to him and says um, that it's grown much the fashion of, um, of my sex to publish after you die, essentially. And she was like, you won't see my, my works in print, but maybe when I die, that'll be the, the next step. So that is, um, you know, I think that, that that was very typical for women, that they would write to each other in manuscripts or um, stick within the conventions of their time for women, but they still were able to do quite a bit um, as well. Yeah, you've definitely uncovered a lot about her life and her con contributions to all aspects of society, um, which leads me to my question of how did her um, religious piety and political views inform her natural philosophy from your perspective? Yeah, so she's, um, she's a very uh, religious woman. She's it's difficult to say what uh, branch of Protestantism that she was a part of, but more broadly, um, a, a, a nonconformist uh, puritanical uh, branch of Protestantism is what she endorsed at the time. And this is, I think, what helped her get involved with the Hartlip Circle. At least many of the key members of the Hartlip Circle shared her political and uh, social views. 
And within that, she made a lot of networks of individuals, especially across the 1640s and 1650s, when the monarchy was not the most important thing. It was Oliver Cromwell and the protectorate, and these individuals were in positions of power. And so she was in this network that helped her both intellectually as well as politically and socially. Um, but even after the when the uh, after the restoration, she's involved. There's still like uh, there's a lot of uh, attacking of nonconformists after this time when England is trying to return to a more stable society and getting people to endorse uh, a mainstream branch of Anglicism. And she is writing in defense of Quakers and advocating for religious toleration. And for her, I think science and medicine is a way to understand the natural world better and to understand God's design in that. And she very much sees um, her role, I think, in understanding the world better is in like helping to reveal God's message, which is, I think, something, you know, today when we talk about this, science and medicine can often be, or sorry, science and religion can often be seen as like two, two very different things. But in this time period, they're very much seen as part of the same conversation. Yeah, and that's really interesting that you mentioned that she thought that it was her role to reveal God's plan, um, because I found it fascinating that she knew Hebrew and used that as a way to both intervene in natural philosophy and religious conversations. Yeah, that's yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, because she so there's a Hebrew dictionary and grammar that's dedicated to her, and she was involved in uh, in probably sponsoring that, but also. Uh, they're they're talking about trying these out like women didn't actually mo many women did not know hebrew at this time and it was like you said seen as kind of an intellectual um thing but she wanted to to learn and be able to read the bible in hebrew and interpret um the information and the secrets within and uh they talk about how she is what uh her the way that she was able to understand hebrew encouraged uh, the editor, William Robertson, to think that more women would be able to understand Hebrew as well, that maybe there is a wider following for this, a wider, yeah. wider possible audience. That's so interesting. Um, so I was wondering if there was anything about her story or anything you discovered about Lady Ronelay that um, you identified with personally. Do you have like, any sort of personal connection with her, any aspect yeah, of her story? Yeah. I personally, I love her relationship with her daughter. Um, Frances is really beautiful to me. Um, they were close with each other and her daughter never marries and the two of them live together. And you don't see a lot of Frances in the archives, but there's a few things like, I think it was, um, there's a letter that Henry Oldenburg writes at some point to Francis and says, you know, apologize to your mom about this, but clearly they were they were intimately connected. There's mentions of her in the household where she has headaches and Robert Boyle is working with her to try to cure her headaches and they're commenting on Francis's response to uh, the treatments that she's receiving. So um, I think that's an endearing relationship that um, it's it's nice to see because I think one of the things you hear about women at the time is um, it was hard, I think, for women to be involved in politics or science or religion because they're running households and she had four children and clearly, you know, a lot of household responsibilities and management. And so I like seeing the the balance and the relationship that, you know, she was a good mother, but she was also able to to do all of this really important stuff as well. Yeah, that's nice. Um, speaking of familial relationships. Uh, to me, reading this, it seemed um, odd, her separation from her husband yeah. um, during this period and how that was sort of just um, an, an aspect of her life and um, her relationship with her brother, mm -hmm. like living together, being like soulmates. I think you said they were referring to each other as soulmates. Um, is that typical of the early modern period familial relationships? Um, or is this a, like a unique example? Yeah. So the her um, so there's there's evidence of some women separating from their husbands, not a ton, but it did happen. Um, you could negotiate for a formal separation from your husband at the time, and I talk about this a few times in the book and it, how to do that. It was not 
common um, to do that. But um, part of this is the way that the Earl of Cork, so he was a very strategic, uh, her father was a very strategic man and uh, kind of a new rich man and tried to exp um, develop his own role in society and the Boyle name by strategically marrying his daughter's places. And most of those marriages didn't work very well. And several women have, uh, you know, Ronalee, I think, is not unique in that. She was put in a strategic marriage, not for love, but, you know, for a, a point of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, her sister, you know, her sister, on the other hand, does marry for love, and that doesn't work out very well either. So mm -hmm. there's that. Um, but it, it is uncommon, but she did this. Um, in terms of living with her brother, I don't have a ton of evidence of that being a thing. This might be one of the most, the, the only like significant brother-sister relationships I can think of, at least in the 17th century. Um, but she's very close with all of her family. And um, there are other brothers too. I, I think there's a comment about her brother, Ori, where she's advocating for him in the Irish parliament. And they make some mention of if you want something done in the Boyle family, essentially, you have to go through Lady Ronalee. Uh, she is the person who's behind even her, her male brothers who are very successful she's behind some of those decisions um so you mentioned her sister marrying for love and that reminded me doesn't her daughter marry one of her daughters marry for love her yeah. um, foot foot man and that's the only name that he has in the archive yes yeah and she just runs off with this guy and it, it, you're right it's and they say that lady ronnelly is very distraught and mm -hmm. uh there's like almost no mention of her except for uh, Boyle does leave her some money uh, later on, but she's kind of disappears after that. Wow. Okay. Um, so what was one of the most challenging aspects of your research for this book? You mentioned um, the name, the name thing, like trying to trace a historical character that has many different names. Um, what are some other like challenges that you maybe weren't expecting? Yeah. So I talked, I did talk about um, the name stuff and uh, the different ways in which you work backwards. But I think what um, I'd like to discuss now is the fragmentary evidence of the archive. And so in doing this kind of research, you never know what you're going to find. But what I found in the end was huge clumps around, say, like the 50s. I have so much information in the 1650s. And I had so much information in like two years in the 1660s that there was so much. But then there'd be like decades where I'd have nothing. And I think that was the hardest part was trying to make a statement about maybe her views changed about something or um, how much did she actually know about this subject when I had so little information to go on and to try to tease out an entire life over so many decades when really it was like two decades that I actually had the bulk of the information. So, you know, when you're writing an a biography of anybody, I think that's a challenge is to try to fill out the entire life as you go. Yeah. Um, is there any archive or repository anywhere that you think maybe would have some more leads for you, but you didn't get a chance to go to? I'm sure there will be. Um, I, th I did not have a ton of time to look at like all of the archives of, of men that she's in her network, but there are definitely some. And now that I live in Philadelphia, I'm also finding addition like the pen stuff that mm -hmm. I didn't think to go through the pen archives before. And there are others that she was writing to in New England mm -hmm. uh, that I am thinking it might be worth a, a, a visit to those archives and start looking and see if there might be additional references. Yeah, the Beinecke, right, with the John. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for my final question, I was wondering if there was anything that you wanted to include in the book that you found that um, didn't make it into the book for some reason. Um, let me think. I don't, um, I don't know if there's anything that I couldn't include. I mean, to be honest, mostly I was so desperate to find information that, uh, I included almost every scrap I could yeah. find, yeah. though I will say that um, what I found interesting in writing it was the story about when she was trapped in the castle uh, at the very beginning. So in researching that, I started to get really pulled into the story about the locals 
Um, so when she's trapped in Athlone Castle, it's during the Irish Rebellion. And there's just, it's a horrific story about like being, you know, all, all of the people that were in Athlone, the Protestants were kind of uh, retreating to protect themselves from the, when the Catholics started to fight. And so there's this tension that starts to develop. And it was a fast, there's stories about people being stoned to death, uh, trying to deliver letters. Um, there's her trying to negotiate her escape point. And that was something that I started, like my imaginations just started to go. And it made me think like, I think about um, Deborah Harkness, where when she wrote her book, yeah, like when she wrote her book and she got her, her trilogy afterwards, because there's like the parts where you're like, wow, this is such an interesting story. And I'd love to, if I could tell fiction, this could be a really good story. And that's how I felt about the Athlone Castle narrative was that this is so good, but I have like two letters and I can't make make up something that didn't yeah. happen. But if I could just step back and tell the story, not just from her point of view, but the larger point of view, there's a lot there. Yeah, I was going to, I thought about rephrasing the question because like as a historian, I want to do that sometimes too, is sure. like spe speculate on limited evidence to, you know, fantasize about a, you know, the world of these people that we're trying to recreate, right? But yeah. you, can't, you can't say unless you have like enough historical evidence to back it up. But. Yeah, absolutely. And there's some real characters in there too. Um, like I think about uh, Valentine Greatrex, the, the stroker, how he was curing people by stroking them, by like healing touch. So there's a lot of great characters and stories that if I could, you know, tease it out a little bit more, I think it could be really fun. Yeah, definitely. I, I would read that book. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so it looks like we're out of time for questions today. Thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing your fascinating work and bringing much due attention to the incomparable life of Lady Ronelai. For more from the Science History Institute, including updates on all our programs and events, you can follow us online at SciHistoryOrg on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on our Lunchtime Lecture Series.